the fact that they said, you know what, it's fine. We'll yeah. we'll see how we handle this politically in other areas and the like, but let's get on with it. I'm glad that we did because we waited. Like I said, you know, Gauteng waited, I think maybe mm. two months, if not more. Now South Africans have developed an appetite to vote differently if you don't perform. Situations, it's a lack of trust because yeah. as again, That's we've it. been abused yes. for years. So now if, if any official, even if they're correct and even if they mean well, if they say, give me this and I'll give you that, there's no way. But I'm speaking about Dobsonville Soweto as a case study where they had no power for nine months, then put in their own transformer, only to have that transformer taken away immediately after elections. And now it's been three months. Welcome to the State of the Nation. I'm your host, Mike Sham. And uh, to get the admin out of the way, subscribe, like, tick, do all these kind of fancy things that make people in my office happy and keeps our channel growing. And support Pace Car Rental. They throw a few bucks our way to keep us on the air. So now we've done that, we can get to the interesting bit because one, joining us today, been one of our most popular guests. And that was a couple of months ago, we featured from Build One South Africa, Ayanda Ali, and we finally got her back. Mike, it's such a pleasure to be with you again. Thank you for having me back. It means yeah. I wasn't all that bad you the last time. You weren't all that bad. And I have been chasing <laughs> you. I have been giving me the run around but anyway we don't have to tell them it's that. it's been very busy who knew being a public representative was such hard work yeah geez where's that you should have you should have stayed in the anc nobody did any look, work there look you look and then you think to yourself ah you know you go home at three o'clock you yeah. sort of get away with murder sometimes literally at times how hard can <laughs> it be and then you realize if you want to do it the right way geez blood sweat and tears yeah now ayanda just so that everybody knows, Ayanda and I had a, about a 15-minute political debate already, but uh, that's just between you and me. We're going to get on to the, the important bits. For starters, Build One South Africa. Right, we've had Musi here, we had Nobuntu here, we've had you here before the elections. For the first time we've got you here post-election. Let's first dissect the election and Build One South Africa's performance in the election. Happy, unhappy, you can't really say you're unhappy even if you are. You, let's, 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 an, let's analyze it very quickly. I think satisfied is satisfied. the word, word. Because happy would mean that we thought there's no room for growth and this was the best that we could do, which I don't think it is. But unhappy would mean woe is me and we yeah. thought you know, we, we didn't achieve anything meaningful and unhappy sustainable. Is cope. So I think satisfied. Yeah, unhappy is cope. You yeah. know, um, and, and happy, I guess, is MK because who, yeah. knew, <laughs> who knew there'd be such a big upset? But I think we're satisfied in that we managed to get a foot in the door. I think that's important. We managed to to prove that we have what it takes to lead. We've already seen uh, Nobuntu, for example, spearheading very important work in GBV. We've seen Musi chairing important portfolios. I myself have been on the ground in Gauteng, and I think we're so eager to prove what we can do if given an opportunity that come 2026, we will just think, you know, sky is just the beginning. Yeah, because either your timing is very good or very bad because after 30 years of basically having an ANC-dominated political scene, the whole world of South African politics looked dead and buried and the one thing you didn't have to worry about was service delivery because people returned them with a majority every time and suddenly the world gets turned upside down, isn't it? So you come into it, build one South Africa, and suddenly you see, hang on a second, there's real accountability Absolutely. And you're quite right when you speak about the, the timing. I think it was a, a cocktail of opportunity for us, right? Uh, people were fed up and frustrated. The ANC was imploding. Really, I mean, you look at the rise of MK and the like, but also people had had enough. You know, people wanted change. People wanted to vote differently. That's why we saw a plethora of different political parties emerging. So I think our our coming in at the specific time was very important. Had we waited a moment uh, uh, later or maybe a little too soon, we may not have been able to achieve what we have achieved thus far. So I think that the timing was really good, but it also then just shows us that now South Africans have developed an appetite to vote differently if you don't perform they've seen what their vote can do so we're excited because if we prove our muscle and we prove our worth you know and our weight and gold then then we're more likely to do even better in the next election i think more than anything mike and, and this is something that really excites me about where we are as a country we are now in a position where political parties have to fight for the vote 
whether you're in the GNU or outside, whether you're in the government of provincial unity or outside, we're all now saying, I want to prove to South Africa that I can do what I said I would do. You know, so you're saying uh, uh, DA ministers, for example, saying, well, look at me, look at me. This is what I was able to do for my party. And you're having here in the province where we're even seeing those who are in the uh, provincial unity government saying, oh, look at us, look at us, we can do this. So, so we're vying for the attention of the voter. And this is how it should be. Nobody should ever relax and and say, I've got it in the bag. You know, the voters will vote from every day is campaigning day, even post elections. So for me, this is a coup. This is really good for South Africa. Yeah, you mustn't say coup on this program. Oh, yeah, it very could be nervous. misinterpreted. <laughs> <laughs> the good but kind. I do understand. The good kind of yeah. coup. But um, uh, going back to this, um, I'm even a fan of the fact that we've got some different alliances in different places. You know, we saw, for example, local government change in Ota and when Freedom Front Plus went into uh, a sort of a, a, a coalition with the ANC at the expense of the DA. It, those kind of actions are keeping everybody on their yeah. toes. We've seen it here in Gauteng and we're going to get onto the Gauteng thing in, in a big way in a minute. Look, and you know, I'm one of those people who like holding hands and singing Kumbaya. Né? So when we heard about this opportunity for people to throw caution to the wind and really just hold hands and walk together into the sunset, I must be honest, I did think, is it not a good idea for us to join the government of national unity or provincial unity and work together and fight from within? But I'm glad that our leadership took the decision to say you must remain as opposition because I'm seeing the value of that now. When you are in this romantic relationship, I mean, I, I remember before things things fell apart in, in, in Gauteng between the ANC and the DA. I mean, there were motions that the ANC would raise and then I second and support, you know, DA would do this. Oh, we vote for this person to be the chairperson. Oh, no, we vote, we when support, etc. When So remember when the government of, of national unity was announced and the cabinet was announced nationally, Gauteng was the very last to form government. Yes. So when we saw the National Alliance play out and we saw ministers from the DA, etc., everybody thought there'd be a copy and paste in Gauteng. Yes. So when we had the first few sittings and the speaker was chosen and the deputy speaker, mm. and you know, and the ANC would say, we chose we choose this person to be speaker, and the DA would say, we second that. Mm. And it was just such a beautiful love affair, you know, love lives here. And we thought to ourselves, who's going to stand up and say when things go wrong and who's going to be the opposition and only then did I really see the value of our position as opposition because now you're able to hold them to account you know you're able to say to the ANC after that bromance fell apart between them and the and the DA um, the DA is also trying to push as a strong opposition but because they've got their ties in the different municipalities as well they can't go in hard but then you have this build one South Africa with I think a fraction of the votes that they had but we are able to stand up and say hang on wait a minute what about this so i think the fact that there are still you know those of us who are in the minority but who are strong opposition voices in the house i think is is is, is absolutely pivotal we're seeing it nationally but we're also seeing it here in the province and i think kudos to the leadership of bossa for saying we're not going to join this mess we're going to be outside and we're going to make sure that we we represent those millions of south africans who need a formidable opposition Let's, let's go back. You, you, you brought up an incident which we covered quite uh, closely here. And that was, uh, you know, the, uh, I can only say because I've seen some of the paperwork, the deceitful handling of the uh, unity in this province. Now, you can make your choices, that's fine. But if I say to you I'm going to do something and I sign a document that says I'm going to do something and then I do something, if I say to you I'm, I'll pay you for your car tomorrow and I drive off today and I don't pay you, I've stolen your car. Sure. And it seemed to me, and I've, as I said, I've seen the documentation, we had Solium Samanga here, that quite straightforward, the, the ANC didn't outsmart the DA, they deceived them sure. in Gauteng. So I'm not privy to those talks. I didn't see the paperwork. I think after the, the, the recording, the you and I will have coffee. Yes. Um, so, so the ones that we saw public, I did see. But I thought you had yeah, no, other, I saw, I saw yeah, other ones clandestine. And okay, like yeah, those ones I didn't see. Yeah. The, the WhatsApp messages and the like, I didn't see. What we saw in, in public is, is what I had access to as well. But I think if, if, if this relationship was to fall apart, I'm glad it did right at the beginning, with minimum casualties. Because had you then had a situation where government was formed, 
work was being done, uh, departments were separated or amalgamated, etc., and we were getting on with the business of, of government. And then all of a sudden, six, seven months down the line, we have a situation that we saw in Johannesburg, if you'll remember a few uh, years ago, where you know there would be a mayor, and that, that mayor is recalled, and a motion of no confidence, and a new mayor, and then there's this and that. And that musical chairs of going in and out was really, really destabilizing for the city of Johannesburg. So for me, I think while while I don't want to go into too much the, the relationships because I don't know who wanted what for what reasons, and that's fine, and the deceit that was involved and the politicking that was involved, but I'm glad that it happened right on the onset at the beginning mm -hmm. so that you, you could see your potential partner for who they are and walk away from the marriage if you want to walk away from the marriage and we can get on with business and we can get on as Build One South Africa with holding them to account. Yeah. So, so I think the fact that it happened right on the onset, great, let's get it out of the way and then let's govern. And the fact that they've actually uh, gone ahead um, after this, this action and formed a minority government, you think this is going to be stable, do you? Look, you can never say what it's going to look like in government. I mean, I could be sitting here right now and the conversations happening behind the scene that you and I are not privy to that will change the situation when I get back to work. So I don't I don't know whether or not um, it will be a long term solution. It seems to be stable right now um, in the conversations that I'm having with some of the members of the legislature. They seem to be settling well. They seem to be getting on with it. Um, and I think in the interest of government, then it, it might be a good thing as long as, again, and I'm going to underscore this opposition is there and is able to hold them to account. But also kudos to the DA. Once they saw their partner for who or what they were, they could have kicked up a fuss. Let's yeah. be honest. They could have called for the speaker. They could have called uh, for a motion of no confidence against Banyaza. They could have done all manner of things. But the fact that they said, you know what, it's fine. We'll, yeah. we'll see how we handle this politically in other areas and the like, but let's get on with it. I'm glad that we did because we waited. Like I said, you know, Gauteng waited, I think maybe two mm. months, if not more. Yeah. with us twiddling our thumbs, you know, not able to get uh, on with the work of providing oversight to the executive because there was no executive, executive yeah. you know, not able to to have committee meetings and and make sure that there's service delivery because we didn't know how to form committees when there's no departments, you know, that's, mm -hmm. that's there um, and we don't know if they're going to be joined or separated, etc. So, so for me, the fact that we could get on with it is what mattered to me because at the end of the day, people still need services yeah. whether there's government or not. Because now we've got, uh, and you're a, a, a member of the provincial legislature, we've got a fairly odd situation. We used to have 10 portfolios and the, and the Premier, so 11. Now we've got 10 portfolios plus two plus the Premier, 30. Right? So, so yeah, so we have, for example, education was a standalone mm -hmm. department. It's now education, sports, arts, culture, and recreation. Um, environment and water and the like have also yeah. then be agriculture. They've also been splits and mergers. And then we also have, for me, which was most worrying, but, you know, uh, the Premier will tell us that there's nothing to worry about. Community safety, you know, which used to be standalone, has now been um, uh, taken as part of the office of the Premier. So yeah. the Premier is then now to account for that, which is difficult when, when you need accountability and he's uh, out doing and, and business that's on as the, back the premier. Of, and that's on the back of him building up a militia. Well, yeah. At the cost. <laughs> I haven't heard you say it's a militia. We call them Amapanyaza, but yeah. It's a militia. Yeah, I mean, yeah. it's a private army yeah. under his own control, sure. right? Mm -hmm. Armed with the best vehicles in the whole of Gauteng. That they crash from time to time. That they crash from mm -hmm. time to time with T-shirts. It all looks particularly odd. Uh, but yet nobody knows what's going on because it's in his office, right? Uh, the, I think there's three other parties, smaller parties, they've got what we could call bullshit portfolios, right? 97% of the budget's being held by the ANC within the provincial legislature. Uh, I can't see how this carries on. I don't know about the BS... Uh, yeah, BS portfolio. I, mean, I did me, have Ruiz for me. Yeah, telling That's us what I was about to say. She was telling me how important agriculture That's is. That's what in I was Kauteng. about to say. I was about to say, I'm not going to rubbish any of the portfolios mm. that are there because I think all of them do have a part to play in building the economy. But I will agree with you that the vast majority of the budget is still very much controlled by the ANC. And I think that's not an accident. Yes. Um, I think it was intentional and it's by design. 
Um, I do think that they can be changed, that the likes of MEC uh, Ramakhopa and and those who are from the smaller political parties who are holding these um, other uh, portfolios, I do think that there is some change that they can do. And I certainly hope that they will bring that much needed change there. But I also think it's very important that we look at the critical uh, portfolios and the departments that you speak about. Right now, what we're focusing on is economic development. Mm -hmm. You'll remember that on the campaign trail, one of our slogans, in fact, the yeah. most important was a job in every home, yeah. you know, so what are we doing to make sure that there are jobs that are being created? The f strong focus of mine, especially over the last so maybe two weeks or so has been the township economy. How do you make sure that there's manufacturing that's happening there and we're not just consumers? How do you make sure that you empower township entrepreneurs to go over and above the usual, you know, tax shop, eh, or spaza shop, hair salon, car wash, et cetera, to arm them and empower them to be able to scale their operations to produce their own uh, soap if it's a car wash, uh, their own fiber for hair if it's a hair salon, whatever the case may be. And to find that there are service providers who we believe are in cahoots with the government um, who are ripping off these very entrepreneurs that we talk about and yet we're talking millions and billions in those portfolios and that's why again opposition very important going through those reports with a fine tooth comb to make sure that if there's even one rand that's a missile out of place people are comfort and we've managed to unearth this huge uh, scandal a scam in Eguruleni um, that has been going on for several years um, and, and, and we're of the view that we really need to shine a spotlight on this because as you said this is a huge department with billions and if nobody goes in there to unpack what's going on we'll wake up and wonder why there's unemployment or wonder why we're not able to grow the economy and create uh, the opportunities that we need and innovate as hard things. So, so yeah, uh, it's important for us to look at that 97% uh, budget and where it's going and how it's being used. Yeah. Now, what is your, I mean, if, if one looks at what's happened in the government, uh, the, 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 the national government with uh, the coalition and where we've seen ministers from the other parties being quite proactive, quite uh, approachable. We've seen a lot of uh, um, communication from them. They've been very responsive, I think, is the thing that has, has sort of pleasantly surprised me the most, is that there's a scandal and you don't say, well, we are looking into it. People actually answer questions. Uh, you're not seeing necessarily the same thing out of the ANC ministers other than Jose and so Ramachopa. The rest, very quiet. But the point is that you at least hearing about this in Parliament, there's action coming out. What is the mechanism in the provincial legislature to get that information out that there's a big scandal? So, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be very unpopular for this. I'm, I'm going to go to your example first before I answer the question. I'm of the view that many of the ministers were, in fact, responsive were in fact um, proactive. You know, there was a... Uh, were raid. or wanted to be? I think they were. And I'll tell you why. You know, the raid that happened in the prison uh, yes. not too long ago, that was not the first time there were raids in prisons. They were previously in the previous administration by ANC ministers. But I'll tell you where the problem is. The problem is South Africans are so hurtful of ANC ministers that any form of proactivity or any form of responsiveness is already tainted with that bitter aftertaste of corruption that we know of. That we paint them all with the same brush. That even when they go out and do something good, we'll always think who's getting a tender here. Yeah. Mm. Or we'll always think what is in it for them? Or, or what's the problem? Why are they being nice? Because we've endured years of abuse and damage to the point where when they s suddenly do something good, we look at it okay. with, with abused colored glasses, not rose colored glasses. So when you have fresh new politicians who come in and become ministers and they do the exact same thing, because we look at them with the benevolence that they deserve having not done anything wrong thus far, we see them as better than the predecessors because the predecessors can do no good in our eyes anymore. We are too damaged and too hurt and too bruised by them so that even when they do a raid, we're just like, I'm sure they're looking for drugs so that they can steal these drugs and resell them, you know? So that's the one thing that I look at. And this is why we need new leaders because if you can't inspire confidence in people, then nobody who's watching you has a desire to be better. 
I don't have a desire to be better. If I know that I, the, 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 the traffic officer who's going to pull me over is going to ask for a bribe, why must I say no to a bribe at work? Mm -hmm. But when you have leaders who are able to inspire confidence in ordinary citizens and we can buy into their vision, I'm more likely to behave better and to be more productive and to do better. So, so this is why the ANC ministers were, were, were shunned even when they did well because there is just too much baggage and there's too much history. So when it comes to the province, I'm strongly of the view that they, they've, they've not received the, the shock wake-up call as they have in national. And I'll tell you why. There are still times when you sit in a committee, I'll take economic development again as an example, and you will ask for questions. Tell me about your relationship with Family Tree Holdings and the Kataras Shop Owners Association and why the residents of Ikuruleni who own businesses say they have not received the funds that were promised to them. That was the question. Those are the questions. Very clear. Then you will f have officials go round about and give you all sorts of fairy tales and creative stories, etc. Instead of answering you fact for fact. That's because for years, they've never had to really account, yeah. right? Because it was ANC government and, and some of them, I don't know, I don't have facts on this, but some of them, I assume, are ANC members, right? So when you then have new political parties who come in and are ready to work and they demand answers, then they say, um, ah, maybe, ah, we don't know, not sure. I'll tell you another example. There is a finding by the previous administration's portfolio committee, that's in the sixth administration, that found that there must be a forensic audit done into the relationship between the Department of Economic Development and Family Tree Holdings. This was written in black and white, adopted by the House, and then just left, just like that. So now comes in an Ayanda, from Build One South Africa, who goes through those old records and say, hang on, here's the answer to the problem that is raging in Nguru Lane. Why has this been left to gather dust? Now you must account. And today we had that meeting with the department and they asked for a special day that they're going to come back and give us a response and they will tell us what the story is. Now, if we had not come to agitate for a report that was already there, when was the answer going to come? So, so I think you're right in saying nationally, we are starting to see a lot of activity between, um, you know, the new, the new kids on the block from different political parties and the ANC and they're all jostling for, for relevance. Provincially, we're just starting to see it now. And I hope that we see more of it from other different political parties. Action SA, I'm hoping, will also come down hard and say, right, open your books, let's see. Yeah, although Action SA seem to have thrown in their lot with... Yeah, I uh, see in Johannesburg. Yeah, oh. but anyway, that's, uh, that, that's, <laughs> that's a different... That's yeah. um, sort of fodder for, for another interview. So the work is being done in the provincial legislature. You're, you're there at the economic development. I'd imagine uh, a lot of those DA um, members of the provincial legislature should, must also be energized by, by the current setup. Or not you know, so you much. can never tell with them because there are days where they will come down hard and you'll also end up nodding and agreeing and clapping hands with their sentiments. And then there are days where you, you sort of wonder, where do you stand? And I'll tell you why. There are days where we see developments in Johannesburg, for example, and you see that the mayor has been removed and there's a new mayor. And then there are questions about Silius Brink in, in Pretoria. And then when you think USDA might lose your position in Twine, then you see the impact in the house because then there'll be a strong emphasis on collegiality. And while they will still come down on the ANC, it's not with as much rigor and zeal and passion because there's still the unfinished business of uh, further up north here in, in, in Gauteng, okay. right? So, so they're in a very difficult predicament of trying to manage the relationship, but also dealing with what's happening in the province, which I don't imagine is a very easy thing to do. Yeah. You don't want to jeopardize your colleagues in Twane, um, you know, by coming down hard on the ANC here in Gauteng, uh, when you just have seen what they did to, um, to the mayor, even though he wasn't a DA mayor. So, yes. so I think it's, it's a tight balancing act that they're having to 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 to, to sort of um, manage or maneuver through. Um, but they are, as I said, you know, they are vocal when they need to be vocal. But you just don't know which DA you're going to find on which day. And uh, of course, they have to manage a big, uh, very delicate national picture as well. Absolutely. But the big question out of all of this is, and you weren't there in the sixth administration, so it's compared to what is you can't answer. Do you feel it will lead to greater accountability? 
Or do you think that, uh, you know, because one would imagine it's harder to hide these skeletons that are clearly there. I do think it will lead to greater accountability. I think because even though the different political parties are trying to work together, the end game is to unseat the other in the next polls, be it local or even the, the next national elections. So they will play along, but they have strategies behind closed doors to, to show each other off, you know, one-upmanship. You know, and say, okay, we're working together, but we're better than these guys mm. because we do one, two, and three. They are not here because they want to win elections jointly yeah, in 2026 sure. or 2029. Mm. So they, they they will hold each other accountable if push comes to shove, I do believe. So questions will be asked, and I mean, if I can overstep my mandate a little bit and step outside of the, the province. Um, if you look at the Bella... Uh, exactly. Granted. Oh, thank you. Thank yeah. you so much. If you look at the education minister, yeah. wonderful job that she's doing, but they're going to be questions asked about Bella. She's going to have to nail her colors to the wall at some point. Yes. There are going to be tensions there. And on a number of different fronts. So I, I do think while they will work together, there's going to be greater accountability because ultimately you need to prove to your voter that we have not merged into one big lump. We still are the DA or we still are the ANC. Um, and therefore they are going to call each other out when the other one steps out of line, which I think, again, is good for the South African. Yeah, it's, it's, it's going to be awkward when she has to answer to Bella, but can you imagine how awkward it's going to be when the ANC asks uh, Minister Grunewald to give a sick note for Zizi Cordwell when he goes to jail? <laughs> That's going to be really awkward, right? <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> Fun times. Yeah. But, uh, times. okay, so, you know, we, we're seeing a, a lot happening and people are, are trying to get the attention of the voting public. Mm -hmm. We've got a local government election ahead of us and all of these things are going to be factored in the local government election i mean i i do ascribe to the thinking that um i if i was ahead of a political party i wouldn't be racing to be mayor of johannesburg right now right yeah. or head of gauteng because my god how do you fix up this shit show i really don't understand yeah. what you your, your reputation can only be hurt in sure. in my opinion because it's so damaged it'll take this will take two or three decades to fix up I would imagine. So I can understand why parties are, are sort of not necessarily racing in to, to, to be part of this. But anyway, that's, that's my own observation. I want to pick up on, on something that, uh, that you speak about and you speak about passionately, and I am passionate about it, and that's economic development. Yeah. right? Because you know, I, I firmly believe that if Gauteng doesn't work, mm. South Africa is not going to work. right? South Africa cannot be run from Cape Town, despite what NISFAS think, even though they've got fancy offices on the foreshore in Cape Town. This is a great hub that reaches like about, I don't know, the number's crazy, about 80% of the country quite closely from here and services these other little vassal provinces in Pumalanga, Limpopo, Northwest, etc. Free State can be serviced from here. So Gauteng not doing well is not a good thing. Let's talk about the economic development because I get, sort of a mixed picture out of this. I've made this point before that um, I know I was in JJ Tabani's show and he was saying that people are living off the 350 Rand grant. And I said that's got to be an absolute lie because if they were living off the 350 Rand grant, they'd be dying of starvation in the street. So clearly people are doing something else. They're not starting up a new supermarket chain in Santon City. So clearly there's something happening that must be of a decent size. I've interviewed many times G.G. Alcock, who's written Cousinomics, who's very bullish on the township economy, right? What is the state of the township economy? It is not in a good state. It is in survival mode. It is struggling and striving but is only able to yield fruit because of the tenacity of the township entrepreneur, the resourcefulness of the township entrepreneur, the way in which they organize, and the way in which they support each other. You, so you've just, you've just described every entrepreneur. It doesn't matter where you are, but anyway. I think more so, more so resilient is the township entrepreneur because they battle things like, I'll use Soweto as an example. In Soweto, there's chronic power outages. So here's what happens. And people always say, oh, people in Soweto never pay electricity. But it's humanly impossible for everybody in Soweto to not pay for electricity. So you will have those who are not paying for electricity 
who will bridge and do illegal connection and the like and overwhelm the transformer, the thing blows up, and then months on end, there's no power. This affects even the one who has been paying, even the businesses that have been paying for electricity then find themselves without power. How do you run a car wash? Mm. How do you vacuum the seats mm. when there's no electricity? Yeah. How do you run a hair salon? How do you do blow drying on the hair and all of that when there's when there's no electricity? Oh, How I don't do have you that cook? problem. Is she saying, "Oh, now <laughs> with a few hair, <laughs> or the hair that's left"? How do okay. you blow? How do you blow dry? So, how do you run a shisanyam? Yeah. You know, you can buy some of the things, but you cook the pup. Mm -hmm. How do you do all those things when there's no power? So they have to then innovate. They try different things. They club together. They do stock fells to buy stock. They try and put in their own transformer. True story. There wasn't an area that went and bought their own transformer and illegally connected. And that's because push came to shove. Nine months without power. Nine months back to back every day. No power. Until so the community came together and decided, I know, let's let's do this thing backdoor. And I'm not condoning that kind of behavior, but I'm saying they get pushed into that corner because those who are supposed to help them are not getting the help to them. Then we had Premier Lusufi, which I thought was a very noble thing that he did. On the campaign trail, he said, even though this is not our competency as provincial government, this is an ESCOM thing or a city of um, a Joburg city power mm -hmm. thing, but we will intervene. And we'll make sure that every single business will get prepaid meters and we're going to get transformers. So everybody pays for electricity. Great. Everybody was excited. Everybody thought this is it. Some successes were experienced. There are pockets where this has happened. But I'm speaking about Dobsonville Soweto as a case study where they had no power for nine months, then put in their own transformer, only to have that transformer taken away immediately after elections. And now it's been three months and they have no power after that. Where is Panyaza Lusufi? He's not been able to go there. I told him in one of the, the debates, I said, you're going to have bubbling undercurrents of unrest that will boil over into protest. And it's as if I was looking into a crystal ball because what happened over the last two or three days, we have been seeing protests, streets that have been blocked, vehicles that have been pelted with stones and rocks and, 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 and people who are not able to send their children to school and the like over something that could have been solved. You sit down with them, you sit with the community and with Eskom, you find a solution. How do we put transformers back in there? How do we make people pay? Punish those who are not paying like they do in the suburbs. In the suburbs, if you don't pay, to me, bad. They switch <laughs> off that thing and, and too late for mama. Sorry for you. Yeah. But, but they're not able to do that and isolate those who are bridging and stealing electricity, etc. And then let those who are paying continue to pay. So, so in the absence of that, everybody gets punished. The entrepreneur at the end of the day does what? Sit in the street corner. There's nothing for me to do. Um, I must now try and find creative ways of making money. And maybe that means robbing someone. Maybe that means um, doing these syndicates of making people pay for uh, protection fees, going around saying, if you want me to look after you, you need to give me money. Those kind of things. Because nature doesn't allow a vacuum. In the absence of jobs, people will find yeah. ways to eat. Right? And that's not what people want to do. Because in, in, innately, they, they are very industrious. They want to work. They want to do the right thing. So if they don't end up in a life of crime, a lot of them will go to drugs. Mm. And we're sending them to drugs because of this. So that's the situation in Soweto. And like I mentioned in Aguruleni, then you have you know, economic development saying, we're going to help you guys up out we're going to give you training we'll give you stock we'll give you funding you're going to scale your operations and then you find the middleman who goes and takes all that money that was supposed to be for the the entrepreneurs or they they don't secure the funds or the stock etc and they leave them high and dry so so the state of the township economy is in survival mode it, it literally is from hand to mouth they're not able to scale their operations they're not able to do the, the, the most that they can do and, and what they, they, they could do in terms of their potential. I mean, the township is huge. It's thriving. Township tours should be a dime a dozen. You know, people going to Shisanyamas, uh, people inventing uh, your, your braai sauces and all of that, or even manufacturing braai stand, etc., owning the culture and then the means of production as well. We should be thriving. This country should have a strong contribution to, to the economy coming from the township, not subsistence from hand to mouth that if the kawash doesn't open this week there's no money so yeah for me as, as far as i'm concerned it, it is just getting by but it is not even a fraction of its potential it could be so much more if we really did have a caring government doing as they're supposed to and enabling them and creating an environment that's conducive towards the growth of the township economy and of course then we haven't even touched on formalizing those businesses. exactly precisely because that's obviously got got to be on the agenda for the country is if somebody is running does get past those initial teething 
uh, stages that you get to the point where I've got, I'm paying my license, I'm paying registered for VAT, etc. But it, everything is informal. This must be the only country where we've got a stack full of this great constitution and law books like this, but we don't, we disregard that. And uh, yeah, I suppose it's a it's a political question, and nobody really wants to fix it up. Exactly, and and I think for the entrepreneur, they're thinking, why should I um, register with SARS? Why should I open an account? Why should I do it? Because all of that is just going to take from me, mm. right? I've not been um, given enough room to grow such that I can accommodate those those fees because I know that there's more coming in. So right now, I mean, it's like the taxi industry. If you tell them, you know, register, do this, become formalized, etc., they perceive it as you want to take from me but if you say if you do that kind of thing we're able to grow the pie bigger and therefore what you receive is much more than what you'll be contributing to the state and um and and to this to this economy so so it's one of those situations it's a lack of trust because yeah. as again so we've been abused yes. for years so now if, if any official even if they're correct and even if they mean well if they say give me this and i'll give you that there's no way you're gonna yeah. concede you're like i know you guys you're taking me for a ride yeah one could look at countries that have had that problem problem to a chronic degree, India springs to mind where for 50 years nobody trusted that the government would spend the tax money wisely and then what are you going to do when a billion people refuse to pay tax, yeah. which is exactly the, the, the state we are getting to. So yeah, you've got a game on your hands, but you do have a relatively rich province, right? I mean, there's, there's, there's kind of money here somewhere in Gauteng. But it's not, it's being purely abused. You said something earlier, and that is that people have to do something. And people did do something. They voted. And they voted to change the government in Gauteng. Do you feel that the voters have been deceived by not getting the government to change? Sure. So they voted to change government but it was not necessarily enough because even though the ANC lost the majority, that, that, that vote that they received was enough to still give them a, an ability to play chess, mm -hmm. right? And I think if they were truly hamstrung, we would be talking a completely different picture. But that's not to say that that gradual decline is not still yeah. in motion because I strongly believe it is. I don't think they'll recover from this. I think, in fact, they'll get worse even in the next elections. But having said that, I think we ought to respect the right of, of those who did even vote for, for the ANC and say to them, we want you to see that even after you gave them the, I don't know, third, fourth, fifth benefit of the doubt, mm. it still hasn't worked for you. And our job then as the opposition is to show the credible alternative, as to show what we can do now that we've been given an opportunity. Because people are, are afraid of the unknown at times, right? Mm. You'll get the first few who are brave enough to venture into the deep and say, we're going to vote differently. And then the next elections, others say, okay, we've seen those guys and it looks like it's working. Let's also Ago. That's how they lost the, the majority to the point where, where they're seated now. Yes, they still, you know, hold all the chess pieces and, and are dominating the game. But I do think that the decline has begun in earnest and will continue even going forward. And in that sense, then the voters' voice was heard mm -hmm. because they said we want change. They may have wanted it immediately. But I think they will get it in the long run because they will continue to see the ANC for what it is. But more so, they'll be able to see that there are alternatives who can get them to the proverbial promised land that they aspire to. And I think that's important. Okay, so which brings us uh, neatly back to Build One South Africa, right, which um, contested the election, got two seats in Parliament, one year up in Gauteng. Um, you, you've certainly immersed yourself in your work. You yeah, have dressed dressed to kill the last time you were here in a t-shirt. You remember me, I was still on campaign mode. <laughs> yeah, in campaign mode, so clearly yeah. you, you, you're, you're here for business. Uh, Moosey's back in Parliament, in a tent somewhere apparently, going to be one of, there one of these days. Uh, it sounds like a crazy arrangement. Um, but, you know, you, your party would have sat down, debriefed, discussed, right, let us in on those discussions and the plans you know, is it just you've, cho you've taken a strong point of not being in the GNU, mm. right? And not even being in the, you know, taking, I presume a seat would have been offered to you here in Gauteng, I presume. 
which you probably said no to, right? We presume. <laughs> we presume. We presume. <laughs> we presume. So you've, you've, you've stayed on the outside. Rizam Zanzi went in. Uh, Action SA, and I hate this, but we always speak about the three parties in one sentence. I've said to you, I think that's a problem. Hopefully yeah. after that, that stops soon. They stayed out, but now they've uh, gone in Johannesburg, which is an odd uh, place to go. Um, what do you think is the is the future for Build One South Africa? How do you become? How do you get that voice heard? You're going to do your work, but so is everybody else. I think sure we did have moments of reflection, seeing where we did really well, seeing where we could have improved. Uh, what we can do better going forward. But I think one of the key takeouts is the original purpose for which we were created yes. as a political party. And that was to give voice to ordinary citizens. Our format of having a candidate directly elected by the community to represent them in parliament or the legislature or in city council, as we're going to see in 2026, works it works because it has the support base from those who feel Ayanda will represent us. And I've seen that work even post the elections where the information that I have that I bring to the table at the legislature is fed to me by community members, is given to me by people on social media, is given me by people who felt we endorsed you to be in this position. Not any lehota, uh, it was not any cabal, that put you there. It was not a coalition of the wounded that got you in that position, but we did as ordinary citizens. And therefore we're entrusting you with this information. I, I mean, I, I'd love for you to see my inbox one day, you know, <laughs> on social media, literally where people will call and, and inbox you and send you voice notes and messages and say, here's what's going on in this section here. Please, can you fight this for us? Here's what's going here. Please, can you champion this for us? And that makes us a formidable force, even as one person in the legislature. I'm just alone. Musi and Nobuntu, it's the two of them there. But the impact that we've been able to achieve in a short amount of time is purely because we may sit as one, but we actually sit as 10,000. Mm. Millions of South Africans who give us the mandate, who say, come and fight for us here. Every week we make sure we're on the ground somewhere, whether it's Leratong village that's put up a fight against city of Johannesburg and Mohale city and they've said, please, Ayanda, come here, come and assist us. And we've done that. We've written to the speaker and we gave them the, uh, the, the, the uh, response and we've won that for them. Or we go to a Guruleni and the entrepreneurs are saying, take on the department on our behalf and we've done that and we're seeing progress. Or it's people who are saying city of Johannesburg, their indigent register is underpopulated uh, to the point where the majority of those who are supposed to be getting indigent grants as per Treasury's allocation are not receiving those grants. And as a result, the city of Johannesburg is pocketing those funds and not disclosing what they're doing. We took up that fight because ordinary citizens came and said, this is what we want. So that's where we saw our strength is. And that's where we're going to maximize. So when others are busy with the government of provincial unity or national unity, which is good, they must get on with the business of governing, fine and well. We're going to continue what we have seen as our strength, being on the ground as much as possible, getting the the, the, the information information that we need from the communities fighting their battles which is what build one south africa was all about that was the grassroots movement that started that ended up in political corridors so we're going to maximize on that and we think that model lends itself even better to the local government elections coming up because those are bread and butter issues of water sanitation and the like now i may have given away our trade secrets here live on your show well but i think <laughs> i think what's important is that the people's genuine concern makes the difference so people can try and replicate this format but if you are not not elected by people and not uh, put there um, because of them and they can't really hold you to account, it will be difficult to replicate. And as a media person, right, you've, uh, you've got a long history in media. Um, do you find that you're getting enough uh, mileage with, uh, with, your, with the work that you're doing? I think people still don't know where to place me as yet. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I still feel... Um, so we will do some interviews. I've, I've had interviews, for example, on the Indigent Registry, on the Ikuruleni Entrepreneurs, um, Liratong Village and the like. But I do still feel some of my colleagues want to almost give me a high five or a fist bump or a hug as opposed to member Ali from the legislature. And I think that works for me, actually, because at heart, I'm still very much a journalist. I've got that inquiring mind. 
I'm still very much an activist. I have strong views. I'm very passionate about what I believe in. I'm still very much a, a, a community development practitioner. I want to be on the ground and, and, and get a sense of what people are going through. But I also want to agitate and knock on, on doors at the legislature and make sure that I ask those questions at the committee. So, so I think my background lends itself best to this role. So even though I don't get as much media attention as my boss, from time to time I'll say, Musi, come and join me. Uh, there's something that I'm doing here. And I know if I say, Musi, my man is there, they'll come through. But I think that's fine because I, 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 I'd rather have people still see me as one of them, you know, whether it's media or it's community workers. I mean, they still, and this is what I insist on. Nobody will call, you know, I end up from legislature. They're still like, I, 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 etc. And I'm just like, this is how I would have it be. <laughs> they still call me by my nickname. I'm still very much one of them. They'll still be like, hold my bag for me. I just need to tie my shoelaces. That's how it's supposed to be. And, and you lead effectively if you're a servant leader. So I wouldn't have it any other way. Well, seeing as though you're, you're a person that, uh, that's not scared to ask for stuff, I'll leave you with one request, yeah. and that is uh, Mission Impossible, I'll call it. If you could possibly get uh, the Premier to, uh, or Siswe Pamla, one of those people, to answer my many requests for an interview, that would be great. I'm so tired of talking <laughs> about him. I'd love to talk to him. Sure. To anybody out there who's wondering why I don't speak to uh, Panyaza Lasufi, I have run out. I can't even count the number of times I've sent invitations for him to be on the show. Uh, it would be great to have him here to, to put some of these questions I don't. Him. I don't know if we're best buddies anymore, but, but something that very few people know is the youth organization that I started in Soweto, Bukobami Youth Center, that's like nine years old now when we launched it in around 2015, etc. Banyaza Lesufi came to, to, to be one of those uh, first few group of uh, prominent figures to sort of give a blessing and to oversee the work we do with young people there. And along the years, I've done you know MC work for them, etc. while I was a journalist. Journalist. Now, I don't know if we're buddies, <laughs> so I don't know if you'll take my calls. No. I've not tried. Truth a try. <laughs> I've not tried. But if I'm calling on your behalf, maybe then I have an excuse. I'll, an excuse I'll yeah. check whether or yeah. not we're still friends and okay. I'll just say hi. That. Mike says. Yeah, yeah. do that. But uh, really, you know, ladies and gentlemen, these are the kind of public uh, representatives we need. Ayanda Ali, I love speaking to you. All the very best in your thankless work. And, you know, we'll keep uh, getting updates from you along the way. Um, and really, best of luck in the Gauteng legislature. Um, we, this place really needs all the help it can get. But uh, good luck with your work. Well done to Build One South Africa and what you achieved. And uh, be great to see you guys uh, doing well in some of the by-elections and then as we build up to 2026. Thank you so much. Thank so, you for having me. It's always a pleasure. So thanks for coming. And to everybody that joined us today, thank you so much. Subscribe to the channel. We'll see you again next time.